You never know if it could change your life. Take a chance. Okay, hey, uh, Rob. Rob. Happy 2020. Happy 2020. Two natural 20s for us to start off the new decade. Foresight, hindsight, present sight, true sight 2020. Oh, wait, that's it. True sight 2020. Hang on. True sight, twi- true sight is 2020. True sight is 2020. You heard it here first at host. Dungeon Master of None. I'm Dungeon Master Matt. I'm Dungeon Master Rob. Rob, we've got to, uh, even though True Sight is 2020, spend a little bit of time reflecting <laughs> on the decade that was uh, role playing games in the aughts, teens, whatever teens, we're calling whatever, this like, Yeah, the 20 teens. That doesn't sound. The 20 teens. 20 teens. That makes. I'll take it. That's as good as anything. The last decade to have a confusing name until we die, Rob. Until we return to the 20s. Uh, we are forever trapped in repeating the same 100 year cycle of. Depression, war, rise of fascism, capital indulgence, uh, just forever until the end of time. I, I can't wait. It's a uh, conjure off waves, uh, Rob. You've got an A cycle, a B <laughs> phase, uh, a recovery, an A cycle. Or maybe it's uh, the shifting powers of the rise of the naval hegemon. We're moving out of the America phase and into whoever's next. Well, I like that. Yeah. Okay. No, okay, that's a uh, old and uh, not a relevant uh, political science theory. Anyway, uh, to reflect on the decade that was, Rob, I have five things that I have decided in my wisdom are the five most important things that have changed with tabletop role-playing games in the past 10 years. I love it. Um, let's see if I agree. And I, I have I have ranked these. I have ranked these. Uh, so uh, in, And I, I want you to... Uh, feel free to disagree or agree with my wisdom here. Uh, number five okay. uh, for the decade was in 2014, the release of fifth edition of D&D. Okay. That seems about right. I mean, I, I'm I wanna just thinking say, about I want to say all... in practical terms, it's probably more important, but I well, would Well, you haven't be, seen what's next. But I would be reluctant to... I have, I have a pretty good guess about what's coming next, and I think they're all sort of interconnected, which makes it challenging to rank them individually. So I agree with that. Yeah, I I don't think we can deny that Dungeons & Dragons releasing a new edition that is incredibly popular and, like, best-selling is is something anyone in the realm of tabletop role-playing games can ignore at all. It's just huge, right? Yeah. It's... An elephant in the in the in the uh, hobby. It's now the dire elephant in the hobby. It's the oliphant in the room, Matt. It's back on top, baby. All right, number four. Um, the sort of development of easy, uh, three D printing and websites that will three D print things for you on demand, miniatures wise. Hmm. Okay. It's not what I would have picked, but I'm not going to disagree. I, I'm I I'm willing to entertain the thought. I like it. I mean, just Outside think about the box like thinking. I like it, Matt. I like where your head's at. Yeah, it's like uh, think about Hero Forge, right? Uh, I mean, oh, we're, I'm thinking we're about big, Hero Forge. We're big fans of playing D anD D or another RPG and not spending a lot of money. Um, we are the God. biggest fans of that. <laughs> I mean, but you and I, like, now we're in a generation, like, you know, not to sound super old, you and I remember, like, oh, someone's doing a campaign uh, where they're using miniatures. You need a miniature for your your hero, right? You can either look through the DM's bag, right, or or find your own. And, man, it was a pain in the ass if you wanted to find a miniature that perfectly fit your character. No, I, and you're absolutely right. All of my players are almost all of my players on their own in my uh, physical games in my in-person games have just got on Hero Forge and spent five bucks, you know, 10 bucks on a mini and loved it. Um, it, it, you it's know, so it's not great. that it's much great. money. Uh, in fact, no, it's not that much money at all. It still sucks. Like if, uh, for example, you kill one of your players, you know, PCs, <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> it's less painful than if you had gone and spent, I don't know how much was like a. How much was like a good quality miniature? Like, and you had to paint it and everything. It's just, I mean, you still have to paint the Hero Forge ones, but it's just, it's just not as much of an investment. And, you, and just being able to bring your own mini is a huge, I, I agree, a huge, huge it's, boost. It's hardly any more than buying a single miniature um, from some like Reaper stuff. You know, a single miniature could be 10 to $15. Yeah. And if you wanted one of those plastic ones that came in a, booster pack that 
Watsy made back in the day, man. You, I mean, you, you had no idea which miniatures you oh, were getting. Oh, for sure. And yeah. now you can actually Most get like... one that looks like your PC, which, you know, guaranteed, exactly. which is pretty great. Yeah, I like this. This so, is good. Yeah. Gone forever are the days, I think, of people who are like, well, I got this miniature. This is like my guy or gal, except, of course, they're not using a pickaxe. It's actually <laughs> a, a battle axe or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Et cetera. All right. Um, number three. I'm going to put as uh, the, uh, I, I think, uh, the, I don't know. I, I debated where to put this one. I think it's the rise of streaming and podcasts for the hobby. Being able to see or hear people play the game. Yeah. I might rank this higher, but I got to see what your next two are. I, I, any list that doesn't include this is a fool's list. We've yeah. talked about this a thousand times. I, I, I We have nothing left to add to this, but the... Uh, the the Adventure Zone and Critical Role and Friends of the Table and uh, all these various streaming and, uh, you know, YouTube offerings that let people see the game and enjoy it that way are, have been just... And this is, this is interesting because it's tied to the overall rise of Twitch and streaming in general, which right. is a larger and uh, somewhat troubling development, uh, <laughs> you know, parasocial relationships and all that sort of thing. But leaving that aside, uh, it, uh, it's, um, it's, it's hard to sort of detach this from everything else, but I think it's critical to understanding the growth of D and D and the, the way the hobby has changed in 2010, because if we were doing the 10 year challenge, let me just do a, a quick digression, Matt. Sure. Go ahead. So, so at the end of the uh, end of 2020 or 2019, a lot of people were doing the whole 10 year challenge. And boy, if you had looked at Dungeons and Dragons, the hobby in December of 2009, I am not sure that there was a worse year for Dungeons and Dragons. That was, that was peak fourth edition edition wars. That was, you know, um, the, Failed rollout of online tools. Yeah, just the lowest, you know, Pathfinder was going strong, but still just, you know, not as big as it just, it was a rough time. People weren't playing it. The the olds were going somewhere else. People were into World of Warcraft and not, you know, like a good little boys and girls sitting down and playing and rolling dice with their friends. It was, it was a rough time right. to be People a tabletop gamer. People were saying gamer. the MMO had killed tabletop RPG. This was a legit thing. take. People that, who were wrong. People who were right, wrong, but, but, but it was a legit yeah. take. They were like, well, now we've got MMOs. People can get their social gaming. Dungeons and Dragons is dead. They were wrong, but boy, what a, what a 10 year glow up it's been for Dungeons and Dragons for sure. I agree. All right, I only have one other system on here, but that is the, and this came out the very beginning of the decade in 2010, and a second edition in 2016, but this was the Power, or sorry, the Apocalypse World rule set, um, which then spun off the Powered by the Apocalypse rules. Now, I've never played Apocalypse World, but I've played four different games using that system. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Matt on this. I don't know if I don't know if everyone will rate this number two, but I think this is super important. I might switch the numbers, but I, again, any any these these are all the same things I would put on my list, Matt. But any any list of the change in tabletop role playing that does not include Apocalypse World or Powered by the Apocalypse is missing something very important. I think the the just sort of. Um... The attitude to playing games of from first edition Apocalypse World, or I guess goes back to Dogs in the Vineyard of say yes or roll the dice. And in the updated edition, the sort of uh, creating histories or connections among the characters. It's a system that, you know, has a focus on a conversation between the dungeon master and players. It is um, still crunchy enough that um, if you're really into creating a custom character class, man, I've seen thousands of custom, you know, move sheets for whatever game. And yeah, I, I mean, there are just so many damn games using this system. <laughs> it's like back when, uh, back in the dark times in maybe 2009, when mm -hmm. there are, or I guess it was a lot earlier, when there was tons of games using the D20 system. Yet this is a system that actually can be used for lots of different types of games yeah there, there have been rules light systems or systems that were meant to be setting neutral that came real close but apocalypse world and its spin-offs is dungeon fought. world masks dungeon City world of yeah yeah masks i mean uh blades in the dark i, I mean 
what what isn't there? It's it's just it's so good. It's uh it's 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 not my favorite system because my brain has been poisoned by an entire lifetime of playing Dungeons and Dragons, but it's a very good system. It's right. intuitive, it works, it's fun to play, it doesn't bog you down. Uh I, I have uh nothing but good things to say about it. And I think it's done a lot for the hobby for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, which brings us to number one on my list, which is the rise of virtual or online tabletops, right? Mm. Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds, uh, and maybe tangentially D&D Beyond, but, uh, you know, the idea that you can uh, play online with your friends, store your stuff on your computer, and it actually works, that's pretty revolutionary. It is pretty revolutionary. And I still remember, Matt... When yeah. you and I and our friends were trying to game after we had scattered to the ends of the earth following college and tried many things, including Google spreadsheets, uh, just Google Excel sheets where we filled in little track. boxes to track uh, movement and location. We, I, I, there were a bunch of websites that were like, oh, it's a shared whiteboard, yeah. like for online classes, and we tried to use that, and they were also buggy and unstable. Yeah, and it didn't was work. really frustrating. It, it, and this, this also relates to the the stability and the growth of video chat and just streaming in general. Uh, again, we are very old, but I remember very well when Skype and then you know, uh, Google Hangouts eventually became actually usable for human beings, and I could call, like, and see the faces of the people I was talking to. That is not that long ago. I mean, that was a little bit before this decade, but that, combined with tabletops that actually worked, Roll20 and, you know, D&D Beyond, and, and things that allow you to play virtually that actually work. And, and these were, boy, these were late coming. They should have... <laughs> There just wasn't enough it money. It should have happened be, earlier, there wasn't but yeah, money no one, in them. To, there's no money, right? Yeah, but uh, the fact that they now exist and they work is a big deal. Matt, there are two things that are not on your list that I'm surprised okay, to hear. Okay, yeah, critique my list. I'm not critiquing your list because I don't disagree with anything on it, but however, here's my two... Uh, bla put my list on blast, right? Uh, yeah, uh, your list is canceled. Here's my list. No, I, there's only okay. two things that... And I'm not sure I would replace anything, but let me, let me suggest two alternatives. One sure. is the growth of... Kickstarters. You know, you're probably right. The explosion of functional and successful kickstarted games, uh, specifically. And this is a mixed bag because for every successful Kickstarter, there's this may actually there's like probably ten failed ones <laughs> that never deliver. Yeah. But you know, every now and then you get a you get a Monty Cook or uh, you know Numenera or the uh, assuming it's ever finished upcoming. Swords Fall or you know any any of these like really big name successful Kickstarters. Obviously, Critical Role has had a couple. Uh, we'll leave aside. I, I remember the first thing I kickstarted Rob was the Thirteenth Age. Oh you yeah, remember that? Uh, yeah, it was do you like a that? add yeah. on uh -huh. for either third or fourth edition, right? Um, yeah, and it was huge, right? It was the first thing I kickstarted, and, and it's like it's, twenty. It's, 11 or something. And this is part of like sort of like a larger ecosystem that includes streaming and a lot like sort of web 2.0 in general social media. So it's kind of hard to isolate, but I think that's that's critical. And that my number one, and this is going to sound pithy, but I'm not joking. I think maybe the most important thing to happen to Dungeons and Dragons the past 10 years is Stranger Things. Mm. I I genuinely think that for mainstream acceptance and for getting people interested in the game, there has been perhaps nothing as significant as the Netflix original series, Stranger Things, and its 80s nostalgia, and uh, full-on five minutes of Dungeons & Dragons, but, you know, endless Dungeons & Dragons references throughout. Yeah, I suppose. I guess if there's, like... 40 million people watching Stranger Things that might be bigger than all of those other things. And I will not lie, I've definitely, when trying to explain Dungeons & Dragons to people, been like, oh, have you seen the show Stranger Things? And they're like, oh yeah, I have. I'm not saying I'm happy about it, Matt. I'm just trying to be honest with myself about, you know, what has impact. And, you know, if, I, I, I don't even know how many people watch Stranger Things, but, you know, Critical Role tops out at, a million viewers, uh, the the very very best ever. 
you know, and if a fraction of the people who watch Stranger Things are interested in Dungeons and Dragons as a result, that's, you know, that already dwarfs that. So, all right, all right. Uh, my list is amended. There it is for for all of you. Uh, the decade in review. Review. Um, so Matt, for the rest of our time, that was very that was helpful. I I actually I liked I liked thinking about that. It's been a good ten years. It's been a real good ten years for for tabletops and gaming in general. So that was uh it was actually useful to think about because boy, the beginning of the decade was a rough time. But what we're gonna do for the rest of the time, or most of the rest of the time, we're sort of we're gonna put put to test one of our something we've been doing for a while. What uh, our new ish official segment, campaign doctor with uh, doctors, dungeon masters, Matt and Rob, uh, where campaign doctor, give me the news. I got a bad case. Of... A game in you. All right, cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if that stays in. Um, but yeah, we, we do this a little bit anyway, but we would like to make it sort of official. You know, if you want us to take a look at your campaign or your setting and do a little, you know, what a script doctor would do in, in Hollywood. Take a look, see what we can fix, punch it up a little bit, answer your questions. That is a service that we offer if you're willing to have... From deep triage to a little bit of nip right. and tuck. We, what, we can do what, it all. Whatever you need. And uh, in order to make this fair, we're going we're gonna to put our... Uh, put our money where our mouth is and we're gonna we're gonna doctor our own to begin with uh, i have some particularly tricky problems that i'm working on in my campaign and and matt has a couple for his as well so we're gonna we're gonna work through that and this will be our our first campaign doctoring and if you you know you want us to give yours the treatment send it our way and we'll, we'll do it on air but um first and foremost if you are a player in my Waterdeep campaign, uh, do not listen to the following, basically, rest of the podcast. Though I don't think any of you listen, but uh, putting that out there. Rob, always being as efficient as possible, telling all of our, uh, you know, a thousand <laughs> listeners, uh, to, to that of which four of the, whom are, are part of his campaign, instead of just sending those four people a text, uh, a good use of, of everyone's time. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Bob. I'll just cut it out. And then I'll leave the part where you scold me in. <laughs> All right. So here's. I, I just want everyone to know I'm the asshole of the two of us. You know, I'm the Han Solo. You're the that's, Luke Skywalker. That's Scott. true. I am the Luke Skywalker. Um, Got uh, no, no spoilers here, Rob, but um, I finally saw, the, saw Star the Star War. War. And I'm like, J.J. Abrams would write a decent, like, homebrew campaign. But, man, he can't write a script for a movie. He really can't. He um, just... He, go find the thing to get I, the other thing. I, I keep thinking about... Go uh, get I'm, the I'm other gonna thing. I'm going to limit myself very briefly. But I keep thinking about how many questions, how many interesting things were seated in the previous two movies that we could have explored instead of introducing return of the jedi inst too. instead of introducing some fucking MacGuffin and having a big scavenger hunt take up two hours of the movie uh the oh make your MacGuffins matter we, we we said this you don't even need the fucking MacGuffin. Abrams didn't listen give to us, us some finn story give us some poe story bring us back the stupid cantina if you must anything would be better than introducing a last minute MacGuffin when there's like ten thousand things we have questions about Bring Phasma back. Make the Knights of Ray matter. I'm sorry, I said I wouldn't get into this. Anyway, uh, uh, Knights of no, Ray. No, I mean Rob's right in that. In that, uh, let's say uh, people have been watching Star Wars for like 30 years. It would be nice if there was a Star Wars that you know, I don't know, went into those tricky questions about what the Force is, yeah. or who should have it, or should a cycle of endless galactic civil war? Are the Jedi uh, good? Kid. You know, is it good to have Jedi? That's fine. It's fine. It's over. It's done. I'm, yeah, it's it's now in the. It's now in the. Me the Star Wars it's now is now in over. the memory hole where I put Game of Thrones. Uh, on to a caring this, about other things. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me. Uh, if you haven't out there, uh, you should look up uh, West End Games. This is for the D6 version of Star Wars, Other Space, which was back in the Wild West days of. Very few, you know, expanded universe novels oh, and yeah, stuff the, like the that. Dark days Western... between between the prequels or bef was it before the prequels even? Yeah, and it's like what Star Wars was wasn't completely defined, and this module 
basically, you know, uh, shifts and like the player characters go to another fucking dimension. And it's super fun and super weird. I had a great time running it for some friends way back in the day. And highly suggest you try it to other space. Other space. All right. Back to fixing up some campaigns. Some campaigns. So as regular... If we were script doctors... As, as regular listeners... The Rise of Scar- we'll Skywalker. Skywalker. <laughs> here's, here's, here's a little taste right. of what we would do. So now we'll do it to our own campaign. So as, as regular listeners will know, I just ran a group of... Uh, six people total, you know, usually a group of four to six people here locally in Portland through Waterdeep Dragon Heist, which was a lot of fun. I liked it a lot. As we discussed, it was a pretty challenging campaign to actually run. There's a lot going on and you have to really keep a lot of characters in your mind. But I, I'm really happy with how it wrapped. But then it wrapped and I wanted to keep the game going. And my players were new when they started, but they are no longer new. So I wanted to give them the option to sort of decide what they would do next so i threw a bunch of hooks at them some from ghost of salt mm-hmm. marsh some from under mountain which is sort of like the next progression but they're not big dungeon people and i respect that i'm not sure i wanted to drag them through an eternity of an adu- it's basically to level 20 you know it's that's the entire rest of the campaign so or their characters yeah career. I, so i once played in a uh i don't know like 23 level um like one through 17 two and a half year mega dungeon and while i loved it at first by the end i was so tired of it so i wasn't sure i wanted them to delve into under mountain but i didn't want to just be like well go to under mountain for the rest of your time with these characters um and then descent to avernus came out as this was happening and so i very hastily dropped some tentative plot threads that might lead them in that direction so what happened was they bit on one of the hooks from Ghost of Salt Marsh, the salvage operation, where you're supposed to go and retrieve yes. the lockbox. And I, I tied it into one of my characters' backstories. Lockbox. Um, and I, I boost... So they're level five, so I, I boosted the, the challenge a little bit. But um, what happened was that they... One of the characters, in character, made a very, very bad decision... And got killed by the elder octopus that was, you know, dragging the ship under and lost the lockbox, which she was carrying with her because she was transformed into a giant <laughs> octopus, which is much ah, smaller than an... Love those wild, wild, wild shaped, shaped Yeah, which is much smaller than an elder octopus, by the way. Anyway, so the the group was sort of... <laughs> she had to re-roll a new character. The group was sort of forced to, to reassess. And um, they went down to Undermountain... Uh, after one of the the many hooks that I threw at them and got the thing they were looking for and immediately booked it back out and um, hightailed it right at Baldur's Gate because I had suggested that maybe they wanted to go to Candlekeep to look for a book for one of the characters who is a divine soul of Mistra. That's her sort of like background hook as she's looking for a, Hmm. a particular piece of writing about Mistra from the Time of Troubles. Ooh. Very nice. So they're on their... So right now, they, just to get things straight, right now your characters are on their way no, to Canada. so Keep. let me tell you what happened. So this happened very fast. Uh, it, basically, I started the session in Undermountain, and by the end, they were all already, already in Baldur's Gate. So I threw the Dungeon of the Dead 3 at them. Um, I, I had them go through the very beginning part of Descent to Avernus, uh, they got there and there were refugees and Captain Zodj, you know, was like, hey, I need your help. I did not have them be as forcefully drafted and I skipped a bunch of the boring stuff in the first part of Descent to Avernus. But anyway, they went through that. It was basically truncated into like three quarters of a session. They went to Candlekeep. They met the mage there. And here's where I'm at now. They went to Candlekeep. They, they found okay. out a bunch of interesting things. I made the following changes. So the Van Thampers in the Descent to Avernus, you know, they're the ones who worked with Thavius Krieg to send El Torel to the, to Avernus, you know, to send it to hell and all that. Uh, I decided that they were working with the the Castellanters from Waterdeep, who were not my villains, but I liked them and I wanted them and their demon worshippers. So, I decided that they were responsible and that all those people were back in Waterdeep working on some sort of sinister 
plan. I also have not made it explicit what happened to El Torel. Um, I have decided that it is uh, obscured by an illusion, you know, because I just, I never really liked the idea of just an entire city being dragged to, it just seemed very unsubtle for devilry to me, you know, just the whole city just disappearing. Right. So nobody... Plus you lose the shock yeah. of, oh shit, that's where exactly. the city so, is. So, a disappeared city is much more yeah. interesting. So that's where I'm at. They've gone back to Waterdeep. They've got some some okay. leads. So Waterdeep's their home, Waterdeep's base, their home right? base. They love Waterdeep. Uh, they have a lot of people there that they care about. The Castle Lanterns are involved somehow. So the puzzle box, the the shield of uh, you know, with the pit demon in it, all of that stuff. I've just sort of, or the pit fiend. I've just sort of uh, shifted. And so mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out how to sort of like weave this all together because as we talked about during our review, the first part of Descent to Avernus is pretty eh. I want to get them to El Torel in Avernus and I want to make it interesting and compelling, but, and, and I have some ideas, but I'm, I'm trying to make sure that it all sort of like stitches together cohesively. Um, and I'm trying to keep like some of the like the big reveals a secret because that's a lot more exciting. I'm trying to make some of the villains a little bit more compelling because that was another problem with Descent to Avernus is that ha the people you meet in the first chapter don't matter. They're not at all yeah. important. And so this is where I'm at. So I bought myself a little bit of time. They're trying to to figure out, you know, what everyone's up to back in Waterdeep. But I'm I'm trying to take the next step. Okay, I think here's a here's a couple of things, right? We've got a problem with villains. We've got a reveal that a city's been dragged to hell, and and how do we want to stitch these things into situations so that um, your 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 players uh, can uncover them? So, have your players had any experience so far with the Castle Lanterns? They have this evil noble noble family in in Waterdeep. One of my players was killed and sent to hell. Where she encountered, you know, the dead souls of children that were suggested to have been sacrifices by the Castle Enters. And that was a hook I dropped early on that they didn't really follow up on. But she's always had that in the back of her mind, that they're bad guys. So you still have, for example, um, the uh, people who've read Dun or sorry, Water Deep Dragon Heist will know there is an encounter at the Castle Enters mansion. There is. And I, and I am okay. hoping... so. Oh, and also I forgot to me I forgot to mention. So in Waterdeep Dragon Heist, one of the noble families they do encounter the Grawlhoons are linked to the Castle Lanterns, and my and my players did discover that. So they know they're bad. Here's what I would one thing I could do to uh, suggest is, for example, and we need to still workshop how you get the players interested in going to the Castle Lanterns mansion. They get there and they uncover. Perhaps, and if you want to bring in Skullport or something, ah, that I the do. Castle Lanterns have been shifting all of their political power, all of their minions, all of their resources to Baldur's Gate, and they have a lot more power than it seems like they've had before. The Castle Lanterns' big plot could be this selling the city of Waterdeep to the devils in exchange for power, and what they get out of it is that they will have a complete takeover of Baldur's mm. Gate, which will then become the most prominent and powerful city on the Sword Coast with the Castle Lanterns in charge. The Castle Lanterns realize they never have enough. There's too many mask lords. Yeah. There's too much balance in the city of Waterdeep to ever take it over, but they can take over Baldur's Gate because the Vanthym peers are actually a sub-branch of their right. family or something yeah. like that. And that actually works really well because the Descent to Avernus puts the idea in the player's head, you know, one, the Grand Duke is missing of, what's her name? Vanthamper is one of the Dukes and she's gone. There's only two Dukes even still around and they don't have much power. The city's in chaos. It makes, I, I like that. It makes sense that the Castle Lanterns are trying you to, have, yeah. I'm imagining one thing that could happen is the players could attack the Castle Lanterns, but it's like, uh, it's like Gandalf and the White Council uh, attacking Mirkwood, right? The Necromancer was already, you know, ready to flee to right. Mordor. Yeah, he's not even there. Okay, that's great. Now, what, what are some ways we could hook uh, your, like, just like three or four hooks I would want to have about why your players would be interested in investigating the Castle Anders, given what 
they already have. So I've given them a bunch. They know. So there's a there's a this is there's a party coming up at the Castle Lanterns mansion, and they do they do love parties. So Waterdeep Dragon Heist for their they have all the layers at the end uh, where you can discuss or where they, where you can there's Xanathar's lair and there's Manshoons and the Castle Lanterns and Yarlax Lbanerus. If for some reason your players end up going there and needing to you know attack the villain at their heart and what the the castle lanterns are suggested to be doing is they're hosting a big party with the intent of sacrificing a lot of the people there to uh buy back the souls of their children uh, i haven't okay. i think i'm probably going to try to work that in um as sort of like a stepping stone to their overall plan you know their their big right. plan which is maybe that's how they got in communication with the devils in the yeah. first place and then they're like, all right, uh, now we want something more because they're, they're, they're greedy. greedy. But I, I could use some more hooks because I have definitely, my players definitely know something's going on, but they, maybe I should motivate them with, with money um, or, or treasure of some sort. What would be? Well, okay. So why not put an actual heist mm, in there? You said they, they had, do they have a ship that they used on the shipwreck? Uh, they do not have a ship. Okay. However, one of their contacts says that uh, they know that a huge cargo is going out of, it, it could be Skullport, probably not though, but uh, it, a huge cargo of, of very fancy things mm. is going out of Waterdeep and heading south to Baldur's Gate, um, and it's ripe for the pirating. Ooh, see, and I like this. And and the party the party could even be cover for for this uh, you know, I, I like this because I shift. do want them to go to Skullport. I want to I want to link Skullport back in one because it's cool, and two because I want it to sort of be a part of the campaign going forward. So I do think that would make sense. They've made it almost a Skullport and Undermountain anyway. So who could who could present this to them, or what is what is well, the I'll tell very you next who could thing they're doing? To- Where? What, where did we leave off exactly in this campaign? Like, what was the last thing that happened the last The last session, session was they arrived back at Water uh, at Waterdeep. They went to the Yawning Portal to sort of, like, check in with some people, uh, where they found out a little bit more about the Castle Lanterns. The very last thing that happened was they discovered a noble had been kidnapped by the Vanthempers, and they um, fought some dead three cultists and rescued him. That was the, the absolute last thing though. So they, the, so they have a rescued no, they do right though. I am thinking the perfect person to deliver this, this bit of information about a heist would be Yarlaxle Bainra himself, uh, who was their villain, but they sort of like ended on a, you know, friendly, not friendly rivalry, but I think, I think they, enjoy him and i think delivered the right way remind me again who Yarl- he's the drow he's the drow is... um, oh yeah that's right the yeah, fancy yeah. guy with drow the hat, pirate the pirate yeah. the probably the least evil of the potential villains for water right. dragon heist well that's perfect for a skull port pirate yeah. mission maybe it, he's his plan is since they decimated i'm guessing some of his organization oh, for sure the players preside, uh, provide the muscle. He provides the info. We split the cargo. 50-50. And he doesn't want, you know, maybe he knows the overall plan too, and he doesn't want Waterdeep to get dragged to hell more than anybody else does. You know, it's his. I would say that a- as of yet, let the players be the first people to discover that Waterdeep has the potential to be dragged okay. to hell. No, right? Because okay. okay. remember yeah, we talked like about that. the Waterdeep. There's too many big NPCs, yep. Yep. right? Uh, have the players be the first okay. ones to I'll discover that. that. Um, he just knows that the Castle are doing a, job. Are doing yeah. a Godfather style move from New Jersey mm-hmm. to Nevada. Okay, right? I like that. That's good. That's a good hook. They'll love that. So we've got the hook on the cat. We've connected the Castle Landers. So I feel in there. good about. We still need to deal with the discovering the secret of El Terrell and discovering when are the players going to discover that Waterdeep is next on the Devil's yeah. hit list. There's one more thing. The last thing I could use your help on is getting to El Terrell. Um Right. So let's 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 just go through that far. So so this is this is, So the players know El Terrell something bad. So this is, is what I asked you about earlier. So in Descent to Avernus as written, 
there's a little puzzle box that Thavius Krieg has with him, which contains the contract which he signed with Zariel, which is, which is okay. I like the idea of devils having contracts. They're very lawful. It's, right. it's, I, I think it's sort of interesting, but I just can't figure out why on earth he'd be carrying it around. I guess maybe if that were like a condition of his contract, but that just feels very contrived. And I'm trying to figure out a reason. What can we drop or how, how would it, what would be a good way for the players to discover either from the vamp Vanthampers or Krieg or the Castle Lanterns that this is what happened to El Torel and why? I, I think the ideal, and it might not work this way depending on player mm -hmm. decisions, way to d discuss this is you have two big reveals, which are going to be lots of fun for you and your players. Discovering that El Torel, not just something bad has happened, but the city has completely disappeared and is in hell. And number two, uh, discovering that the, the castle lanterns have a puzzle box with a contract with the devils that a water deep will be next once El Torel is completely engulfed by uh, the nine hells of Bator, right? So is the contract the one for El Torel or the one for water? Well, in the, in the, in Descent to Avernus, it's for El Torel, but that's perfect. But okay, that perfect. makes perfect sense. Okay, so, well, so, no, now, no. so now there's a new contract and this makes sense to exist, right? right. There's a contract yeah. that says, Per our agreement, you know, with uh, regarding El Torel, once El Torel is fully engulfed, uh, you know, follow, assuming the following conditions are met, Waterdeep will subsequently be subsumed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's great. That's perfect. There's a reason for that to okay. exist. They can find that somewhere in the Castle Lantern's mansion or something. And a couple, a couple things, right? Um, which is one. Um, you should make sure that, that the Castle Lanter's new devilish power is apparent, whether the players Ooh, are investigating at the yeah. party or the thing. They should have some imps or some servants, mm -hmm. some of those abyssal, or sorry, devilish weapons. Number two, I think you should just give the players a reason to investigate El Terrell, right? Yeah. Having them find out, go to the city itself. It's not that far away, right? It's a It's and a... It's a they, week's they journey have, from Waterdeep. Uh, they have the the Hellrider, uh, Rhea Mantelmorn, with them. She's a, a minor character from the first chapter. I didn't want to, like, have her just say, hey, we should go to El Torel, but I've been trying to push them in that direction. So maybe I should just drop, like, a more substantive, like, suggestion. No, let's let's find three more clues to okay. give them, right? One on the, uh, on the ship, right? It seems they're going to find a manifest that shows the Castle Lanterns basically moved all of their... And I'm making the Castle Lanterns into a basically a noble family that has dealings from Neverwinter, yeah. you know, south of Baldur's Gate and, and in El Terrell, right? They basically moved all their assets out. They were conspicuously not at work mm. on the day the, the planes hit the towers. <laughs> yeah, um, I like that. I like one, that. This is right? good. This is good. Okay, so there's one clue. Uh, number two, at their party... What's a clue we could put at their party that may, might make the players curious about the missing city of El Terrell? This might be a good time to bring in Krieg, uh, the, the overseer, because I never liked how he was so unimportant in Descent to Avernus. How about he's in one of their prisons downstairs, mm. right? And they can run into several, and to make sure this clue is found or to increase its likelihood, several servants, right, um, are whispering strangely, right, um, about this uh, weird uh, Krieg guy that's being held uh, in the in the Castle Lanterns dungeons under their mansion. Okay, that's good. That's great. Uh, let's see. So that's two clues. The third clue could be like, you know, just something of if you ask one of your, if they go to any of their favorite contacts, right, their favorite contacts are like, well, I mean, we're the city's getting the city's watch is kind of worried about what happened to El Terrell. It was major trading partner with Waterdeep. Um, the the black cloaks or or the I, I can't forget what the magical uh what are they called unit is called the red cloaks, uh, black, the wand black staff? guard. Uh, sorry, the force gray. I don't remember. Force, force gray. gray. Force gray is uh is planning on sending you know some mages to investigate. They don't have the resources yeah. to do it mm. until next well, month. Well, and they've got, that makes perfect sense. They've got, you know, they have all their faction contacts, including one 
with Force Gray, right. so I could just have Force Gray tell him directly, hey, we need your help. Or just wait wait for them to talk to one of their yeah. contacts, and whichever contact they talk to, I mean, it's a little bit of a quantum ogre, but that's fine. All right, now, yeah, uh, well, I would say you need to design also a really cool encounter of them encountering this illusion, right? Yeah. It could be like that El Terrell is surrounded by basically a illusionary black hole that is also phantasmal well, well, killers. Well, is... Like they see themselves going in and they can never get out. So or something I'll, I'll tell like you that. what I, what I worked out. This, there's, this is not made into the campaign. So if this is a dumb idea, you can, it doesn't have to exist. Right, but but what it. I, I was, I was poking through the spell list and uh, a mirage arcane spell is just about big enough to cover El Terrell. And if you combined it with, and this is not an object to, to exist, but some sort of super amulet of non-detection, I called it a, a lamp of non-detection. If you installed a bunch mm -hmm. of these in the border, you could put up a, you know, a big old illusion that makes it seem like El Terrell is still there until you got, like, basically right up to it. And it would prevent scrying and divination magic and all that. Ah, uh, this is perfect. All of their con... So they found out, perhaps, here's one hypothetical scenario best case right they found out the cast lanterns have moved all their personnel and resources out of el terrell and they've heard from their contacts that like no one from el terrell is responding and basically uh uh they it's basically the city's gone completely, completely dark, dark yeah. right and that would be good especially like oh the, this would be great for the harpers if the harpers are like uh you know none of our you know, none of our spies have reported back. We haven't heard from anybody in days. Now, how uh, we, we, we need something to explain, like, and so here's what I, I can imagine for that encounter is basically they go to El Terrell and they see the city as normal and like, but everyone's sort of glitching yeah. out and, you know, like they have a conversation with someone and it just sort of it loops, loops uh -huh. around and around again. And then to explain why no one's returned, because obviously other people have tried to visit El Terrell before them. It's a fairly big city. There's also some sort of challenge appropriate assassin that's hiding I mean, in maybe, the illusion maybe just, that tries to maybe kill just them. Devils, you know, in disguise yeah. uh, that are. And then once they see through the illusion or yeah. sunder this lamp of of shattering, they see that. El Terrell is in fact a you know smoking completely crater in the ground. smoking yeah. crater, okay. and that they were just talking to. Uh, and you should make the city like 1950s perfect, yeah. right? The de is just sort of uh, <laughs> it's everything's a little too yeah. nice. Um, it looks like one of those towns that's about to be blown up by the right. atomic yeah. bomb. Okay, <laughs> all this the is kids great. are out bouncing a ball in the streets um, in unison. Jumping rope. This is great. This is together. great. Together. Because they <laughs> yeah. know something has happened in El Terrell, but they're not. And then, boom, that makes the discovery that it's, uh, there's devils and it's a smoking yeah. crater. And then when they go to Candle Keep or, uh, decide, you know, do a divination spell to find out where it is, it's like, oh shit, it's, it's in, in hell. hell. Yeah. Or actually, actually, you could still leave it there. They'll have a clue, mm -hmm. right? They'll have many clues about devils and things like that. But eventually, like, you know, they're like, well, we, we can go to Candlekeep and we can have a mage try and teleport us to El Terrell. A mage can tell you, I can't teleport you to El Terrell. I can plane shift you there, but I don't know where wow. it is, right? And the plane shift happens and boom, oh shit, it's in mm. hell. Okay, I like that. Okay, that's good. The other thing is, I think, uh, you know, one thing that we talked about is there's never any, you know, going... Your players might be the type of players who might want to go back to Waterdeep after going to hell. And this is the thing I was thinking about. And I was thinking, rather than have it be a one-way plane shift, what if there's a portal somewhere? What if there's a rift? Maybe even in Undermountain or somewhere that they could potentially go back and forth if they want to uh because i i don't want to like i think it's probably fine if they're in hell you know through the rest of the campaign but it might be nice for them to be able to within reason return to their home base uh you could also give them a magic item yeah, that will let them that's plane true like shift just give them something with something like limited like plane shift ability yeah you know the wizard's like sure i can plane shift you down there but for an extra thousand gold i'd be be happy that's, to that's uh, 
just sell you this That's item. That's a great idea. In case you have to come I back. Just, I hate the idea of a one-way trip, you know? Especially, they've got so much attachment to Waterdeep and, and yeah. so many allies there that I think it would just be... It would suck for them to not be able to talk to them or go back for five or ten levels, or five or six levels. One more mystery I have here on the campaign doctor, right, is the sort of terrifying discovery that not only has this city disappeared, the castle lanterns are planning something big, but that, in fact, if the players do nothing, that water deep is mm, next. Mm-hmm. I think the characters should have to find this out back in water deep. Yes. Perhaps so the, puzzle, the box puzzle box is so this held is, this where is how the I'm, original contract yeah, was signed. This is how I'm imagining the final... This is this is my ideal path. The players may not follow it, right? So, Jarl Axel Bainra or somebody else tells them, hey, there's something big going down in Skullport. It relates to the castle lanterns. There's... A cut in it for you, and also you get to stick it to the castle lanterns who you hate. They find out some more hooks about El Torel. They go to El Torel. And Baldur's Gate. They go to the, the city. They find out that it's been disappeared. For the final step, you know, they've got to go back and they've got to find proof. And that means going to the castle lanterns party and exposing them or finding the final piece of proof, which is this contract, which is in the puzzle box or... I may not use the puzzle right. box, something like that, which is the final piece of the puzzle. And then from there, they can be like, all right, we got to find a wizard. We got to get to El Torel. We got to stop this from happening because Waterdeep's going to get dragged to hell. Here, here's what I would I would say is that if in case, keep it open ended enough that in fact, the puzzle box with the, the contract, there's more than one castle lantern, right? There's, there's a, a husband, husband and wife. wife. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Here's what Ooh, you do. Uh, right? I already know where you're going and I like this. Okay. Okay. It's. Because they might decide they want to go to the party, for example, before they go to El mm. Torel or to Baldur's Gate. Or, you know, they really want to get more info on the Castle Lanterns, right? The Castle Lanter thing could come after also. They might already go to hell. Yeah, that's Once true. Once El Torel disappears, they might be like, let's go straight to hell. Let's go to that wizard we heard about in Candlekeep yeah. that can teleport us there. Is whenever they decide to try and confront the Castle Lanterns at their main base of power, which, if it's earlier on, will be in their mansion in Waterdeep. If it's later on, it will be they have taken over the city of Baldur's Gate Mm. and given up mysteriously and unusually all their holdings in Waterdeep, Mm. which is a hint to their their plans. Um, They uh, fight the Castle Lanterns. If you're ready to have this reveal you can go ahead and have them discover the contract. Mm. If you're not ready to have this reveal, if this happens like the first thing they do, like the first thing they do is go to the party, you have the other husband or wife, whichever one wasn't there, be the one with the contract. You could have the puzzle box still, but make opening it a more interesting thing. Oh, how about this, Rob? How about they find the puzzle box whenever they confront the cast lanterns, either at their manor in Waterdeep or in Baldur's Gate, but the thing that gets the puzzle box open and identify spell will do this is you must pour blood over it that belongs to the castle lantern that they don't have in their Ooh. possession right Ooh, now. Okay. And so that's why they keep it on them because it's like, oh, uh, the blood of a, the willing person must be mm. poured mm-hmm. upon it. And so to get it to open, they have to go catch the other castle lantern, pour it open, and then that reveals the contract. I love it. Yeah, and that leaves it open-ended. And then they have the quest to go destroy the original contract down yep. in hell. Perfect. Okay, that's great. That gives me plenty to work with to make sure that I that I can smooth out all the edges. I have an idea for El Torel itself. We talked about how we didn't love the second chapter, but I love... Right, yeah. What, that was the other thing, is once you go down to hell, you start in El Torel, and while that's kind of level-appropriate stuff, Yeah, right? it, I, I'm going to need to adjust stuff. the the challenge rating a little bit, but I, I, I want to use that because I love the idea of fighting your way through a blasted city in hell and like trying to rescue the yeah. Grand Duke. But as it's written, it's just a bunch of like random encounters. So I have a lot of time to rewrite that and I'm I'm working yeah. on that. I have a, a bunch more. That's far enough yeah. down the road. I mean, my, my instinct would be like, um, your players haven't had the equivalent of like a war mm, kind oh. of thing yet. And basically, you know, uh, map out the city and be like, these are the places that are controlled by the various human factions, which uh, this in is their a great idea. three months down here have begun this to split. Is a great idea. These are the yeah. parts that are controlled by demons. These are the parts that are controlled by devils. The players, which your players love, the sort of diplomacy, yeah. sort of talking to people might be able to navigate their way through or yeah, worse comes the to worse, fight their way this through. This is the, you know, yeah, this is the, 
the devil section. Here's where the, you know, the paladins of whatever have holed up. That's a great idea. I, yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to adjust that. I'm going to do some work to the, the path of devils and path of demons, all the things we talked about liking, but, but beings yeah. are sort of, um, linear. Yeah, linear and grindy, but, uh, I have a plenty of time to work on that. I, I now I've got like a nice solid path for getting there. Um, and I can tie in some things that I'm excited about. So thank you, Matt. That's very helpful. If you couldn't tell, we can always find the trouble. We don't need no help. See and all. Mama raised me well. But I don't want to go to heaven without raising hell. Get it. For all our listeners out there, right, if you're ever stuck, right, having another friend who is not one of your players, which sometimes is hard. (laughs) Sometimes you can't find that person. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, sometimes all the people you know who play Dungeons & Dragons are the people in your own game, right, sort of talking out your campaign, Yeah. right? If you can uh, keep it succinct enough that you can keep your friend's attention, right, you can, uh, is really helpful, right? I've done it dozens of times. So... We got a little bit of time left. Let's talk about levelers, Matt. What are you What are you working on? Right. So we're resuming our campaign. We had a, a long hiatus while uh, all three of my players moved to a new city, and then one of them had a baby. Um, but we're coming back now that the baby is uh, grown enough. It does not need a 24-hour care. Um, most of the things... My campaign is pretty episodic, but um, I'm working through their next couple adventures when we last left off they had rallied uh some townsfolks by the way levelers is a game about basically a narco communalist witchers yeah um that go from town to town and solve i I played in a a draft of this and it was it was a great idea it's super cool yeah just going it's fun town town solving problems which is yeah uh, if you were and if you were like in our review of the witcher you're like why can't everyone just be a witcher yeah that's basically my yeah. idea. Uh, it's heavily inspired by Dogs in the Vineyard, but uh, Dogs in the Vineyard is kind of icky sometimes because you're enforcing uh, 19th century Mormon social norms. Not great. <laughs> which, you know, not sort great. of not great. Uh, but I mean, it's fun if you're like, ooh, what should we do? But I, I want my players to be and my players want to be the actual good guys. Yeah. So when they last left off, they had rallied. Uh, There's basically a wizard that was mining evil gems and had uh, upset a bunch of mine fey. And by mine fey, I mean fey that live underground, sure, sure. Uh, which was a lot of fun. They played with some boulders and some weird gnomish-like things that could grow their hair. And uh, they basically rallied uh, the townsfolk to storm the wizard's tower and his guards. And they, they had several sessions of, of doing this. That was a lot of fun. They learned the lesson. Townsfolk uh, are level one commoners. And while (laughs) they can be inspired to do a lot, uh, they can die very easily (laughs) to a fireball. So right now they have a lot of guilt on Ah. them uh, for basically leading a bunch of villagers uh, to their death. But uh, their path of uh, solving problems must continue. And they have a a choice, and I don't know where they're going to go, but they said they were interested in... In, in hitting all uh, three of these is uh, so they're they're interested in going to uh, some forest communities that said they needed their help. One is going to be uh, I all I literally have in my notes, Rob, is village infected with lycanthropy. I love or lycanthropy. It. I mean, a class. And I have no other ideas I mean, besides that. But uh, for that, that's one. a. I mean, okay. So sorry. Let, let's let's hear your others before we get there. That's honestly okay. That, that's enough for me to run a session. <laughs> like you know. Sure. That's... Sure. I need a little more prep. Than yeah, that. but uh, but I, I love the idea. Yeah, but go ahead. What, what are the others? Uh, the other one is if they follow uh, where the next like wizards town is, where there's you know evil wizards. Mm. They're going to find that the and and this one's, I think, a little more fleshed out is that monsters have been hunting the villagers. People have been dying. They're going to go and kill one of the monsters and they're going to find a serial number on it. And they're going to find that the wizards have been mass producing these and testing them on the poor defenseless peasants. And the other one, which I do have pretty uh, planned out, is uh, a town I plan on throwing in there whenever I don't have anything else prepared, which is basically a Groundhog Day town. Ah. Uh, There is someone who has discovered some ancient scrolls that uh, create immortality 
but the uh, they've done the spell wrong, or of course this magic has a monkey's paw to it and can never work, and they're at a village that has been resetting again and again. Uh, I haven't come up with a good reason why they're immune to the reset, um, but once I do, that one's well, ready to roll. Well, here's here's the thing. Don't make them immune to the reset. Just have them remember. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. That's why they, by being immune to the uh, reset, I mean, they remember. Oh, because, they're not be, immune to the reset. Um, after I mean, after two hours in the town, they go back to the edge of the right. town. So, I mean, the, the obvious answer is that they're... Obviously, the town is having a polka festival <laughs> as they arrive. Is that but they're... The music... Da, da, they're da, immune da, da, because they're... Da, 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 they're levelers, right? They're okay. their unique uh, magical lineage and you know, powers. I was actually that's how I was actually. They're in the middle of a. They, they were looting the wizard's tower when we last left off. So I have some unspecified loot. Mm. So I could give them all amulets of resistance that actually um, that too. Help so them prevent them from resetting. So you've got three good options. Um, how um how do your levelers do they do they have like is there a is there a guild that gives them like leads or do they just have to hear from like villagers like one this this town's got a wizard problem and they go to the next place how do they make their decisions yeah they they it's just up to them okay. where they want to go um for the first couple sessions i was like here's the next village and then the next session starts with them entering the next village but after that i i opened it up and said Okay, you know the village to the north of you is um, in the forest. One person in the village you're currently at who's been there said they've had problems with wolves. Uh, the one to the west is un in the wizard's territory. It's where this wizard that escaped is most likely to have gone, right? And the one to the south of you, um, you have heard nothing about, right? All right, a few things here. So I'm thinking about the, the village with lycanthropy. You could always just do your standard murder mystery with a twist, right? Somebody's right. killing people in the village, but... And who's the who's werewolf? Who's the werewolf? That's always fun. Make it somebody they don't expect. But... Ooh, what about if everyone's already a see, werewolf? and so this is what I was thinking. What if they're all werewolves, and what if they all became werewolves because there's something worse? What if they all became oh. werewolves to defend themselves? And they're all they're all trying to hide. It's a murder on the Orient Express, right? right at yeah. first, they're reluctant to tell them that. Guess what? We're, we're all, all werewolves. werewolves right. here. So, so that's the thing. <laughs> this is so your, great. Your players are going to get right away. I call this game. We're all werewolves yeah. here. Your players. We're werewolves, <laughs> not swearwolves. <laughs> werewolves, right. not swearwolves. Your players are going to get right away. They're smart. They've been. They've played these games. They're going to know it's werewolves. The tr the twist is they're all werewolves. And, right. but why, right? Why have they all become werewolves? You know, that's, that's the twist. And that's like, I think that'll be a really interesting. So, mi okay. Uh, help me, help me, uh, think out why they would all become werewolves. Well, so werewolves under five E, do they have any special resistances? Sometimes you can get inspiration from a stat. Block. Uh, oh gosh, I don't even know what they do. Uh, let's take a look real fast. Um, do they have damage? They have damage. Uh, uh they have damage resistance to everything not made with uh, silvered weapons. Yeah, so... So, so what, there could be something hunting them. What hunts what a hunts wolf? hunts a wolf? Ooh, um... Well, what, what kind of... hunts a wolf? What kind wolf? of baddies do you have in your level leveler world? I, obviously, wizards are bad and, you know, mystical foes. I've said that anything in the D&D &D handbook can also be in there, okay. right? So any sort of monster or something like that. Uh, grizzly bears, Siberian tigers, and of course humans. A Rakshasa. What if they're being hunted by? Ooh. Or what if they're? What if there's like a Rakshasa in the town or nearby who's been like killing them or preying on them, and they and they they made a deal or they all like took an oath to become lycanthropes so that they could defend themselves against, you know, this hideous tiger person demon. A Rakshasa, and, like, they've never encountered Rakshasas in my game, and these ones are, you know, you can always play around them with enough. Like, the Rakshasa was in sort of traditional Indian uh, mythology, like, con consuming raw flesh, right? right? Yes. Of people. of people, yeah. And that's all it really cares about, yeah. right? And I can always say there's different Rakshasas that have bigger bigger plans, yes. right? There's, there's a werewolf patient zero. Yeah. Maybe he's a hermit yes. or something that lives outside of town. They tolerated him and, or they uh, knew he was a werewolf and they were like, hey, we all need to right. be, 
we need what you have to survive. You know, the Rakshasa is killing and eating us. And um... when when the players arrive, I'm going to start it that traditional way. There's been, There's been a, been a murder, murder and the players are going to guess immediately it's by yeah. a werewolf, mm-hmm. right? Full, they're like, uh, wait, uh, these wolf tracks, uh, this shredded corpse, was it a full moon last yeah. night? And it's like, obviously, the kids have a hard time transitioning to being a werewolf. Sure. Sometimes they lose control. Mm-hmm. The village considers this acceptable losses because they were all going to die to... Right, um, this is just a price rakshasa. they had to play. Pay. What, what else does this rash- Rakshasa... Well, what has the Rakshasa done since the village has become werewolf? Well, so it's basically... It's been held there's, off. So here's... I, let me know if you think this is too complicated. But Rakshasas are okay. also shape changers. So uh-huh. what if the, the players are now stumbling into a Rakshasa war? There's a wolf headed Rakshasa versus a tiger headed one. <laughs> no, the Rakshasa is in the village as well. And all of the villagers are werewolves except for one who's a Rakshasa. And they're trying to survive long enough to kill the one that's hunting them. Now, that's too complicated. Just have it be. Oh, OK. No, it's honestly not. How okay, about this, on. right? OK, here's how the plot goes, right? Players arrive. Someone's been murdered by a werewolf. They find out it's a werewolf. They then find out everyone in the village is a werewolf. The villagers, right, try and explain to the players or they can, they tell them where the village, you know, werewolf zero is. Um, They discover that they all intentionally infected themselves with lycanthropy to defend themselves from a rakshasa that has some place of power outside mm, the village. Mm-hmm. A little dungeon, a shrine. I'm not sure what Rakshasas live in, right? A little palace it's made they're, for they're, itself. They're magical. It could be a wizard's tower or anything. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. The, an illusory palace outside the village mm-hmm. that the that the villagers were able to defeat. They go there and find the Rakshasa is not there anymore. Mm. And that the Rakshasa is now disguised as one of the ah. villagers. So we're actually back to <laughs> one of the villagers is the murderer. Ex- I, I actually love that. Yeah. And so it's a it's a twist upon a twist. Upon a twist. Uh yeah, I, I think that'll I think that'll be good. Get the fuck out of here, M Night Shyamalan. Yeah. Um, okay. That's great. That's your that's your like that's your uh That's uh our, we're all werewolves here. That's right. Except one of us who is a rock <laughs> That's your updated That's now the title. Uh yes. lycanthropy hook. It sounds like also the other thing I was thinking when you were talking to me is it sounds like the players need a chance to redeem themselves. Sounds like they had their yeah. their butcher of Blaviken moment and they're they're feeling They they really did. I mean it, it not in the same way. Like they didn't cut through a bunch of mercenaries and then get framed for it, but it's like they sort of assumed that, hmm, there's an evil wizard and we know he has a guard of six armored men at arms, mm-hmm. right? The villagers have been the ones suffering. Uh, they got a little <laughs> deep into some theory here, but they said that the villagers need to be the ones to liberate themselves. They tried, they tried to seven samurai it. They tried to... They tried to seven samurai. In fact, they I think one of the players exactly said that. They're like, well, let's seven samurai this, <laughs> right? And they got all the villagers with marked stakes and I didn't want to, like, be a dick about this, but my plan was always when they fought the knights, this wizard would show up at the top of the tower, throw a few spells at them to make it challenging, uh-huh. right? And then go back in, and they would be like, well, fuck that guy. But the wizard did that, except there was a bunch of level one commoners, most of them, like, teenagers. Yeah. Uh, some of them, one of them, the one of the players had developed, like, sort of a maternal relationship <laughs> with. And so they all got fireballed. I mean... And sometimes um, you get fireballed. So, yeah. So, um, okay. How do we redeem well, them? And this is, I think much like Geralt's story, a, a long-term project, right? The, the, the path, right. this is a campaign. The, the path thing. to redemption is long, but I guess this is sort of up to you and I think it can be organic, but you probably want to give them a chance in each of these villages to make a hard choice to, you know, to despair somebody or to, stay their hand or to, you know, take on a burden that they might not otherwise, you know, to make up for, for what they did in the past. Maybe they, maybe they take on a ward. Maybe there's somebody who did a bad thing who they might be inclined to just kill, but they should spare him or her because, you know, there's enough blood on their hands. Well, and I I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, To put things in another way, like I have a party of, like unintentionally by designing the system, like 
very like neutral to lawful good players. Mm. And these are players who have historically not always been neutral to lawful good. Like they have made the hard choice and usually, I mean, I can't be the one to judge whether it's right or wrong. The one where they've felt best about several times Mm -hmm. it, this, the seven samurai thing was, uh, I think a, an honest mistake. It was well-meaning and you know, sometimes things don't go your way. Exactly. It's not that kind of story. (laughs) Uh, So, I mean, I think a chance for them to, uh, save a large group of people Mm. maybe that Mm -hmm. don't owe them anything. So I'm thinking next time they go to a town that's in the clutches of some evil wizard or evil empire or something like that, instead of, you know, rallying the town against them, they would have a chance to sacrifice themselves for people who don't even like them. Right. right? I'm not sure what sort of monster or situation would engender that kind of uh, choice. Uh, and another thing that you can do it isn't quite as challenging drawing again inspiration from the Witcher is, you know, maybe they come to a, ca- a town that's been enthralled by or lied to by a wizard and they have to take great pains not to kill any of these townsfolk uh, who were trying Ooh. really hard oh. to get uh, killed uh, by them um, because, you know, they're, they're trying to do the right thing and it's not their fault. How about a, a Twilight... <sighs> I mean, maybe this is stealing too directly from spoilers for the first episode of The Witcher, but a sorcerer who's just like, I have the charm person power, I have the friends can't trip, I have um, uh, I have the dominate person yeah. spell. I basically enthralled everyone in a village. Uh, I'm Mr. Purple from yep. Jessica uh-huh. Jones, if anyone yeah. has used that. I think that's great. And, and, you know, it's, yeah, of course it's been done before, but it's a good, it's a good challenge for players and i think that it's uh i think it's a great way to you know force some different decision making especially for a good aligned party yeah Mm -hmm. uh just all right i think i think that would be a a good chance for them to uh approach a similar situation and try to, to you know make up for or redeem themselves in a certain way All right, uh, Rob, uh, thank you for doctoring, playing doctor. Of course. Uh, this was actually super. Get, are, are you sure you, you don't want to call it campaign doctor and not playing doctor? I'm 100% sure I want to call it campaign doctor. Uh, Let's call it playing doctor. <laughs> Playing doctor with Rob and Matt. Okay. It's it's not all that. Uh, Yeah, this was actually super helpful for me. Thank you, Matt. This is a lot of fun. If you want us to give your campaign or your homebrew setting the same treatment, send us some questions and we will do the same thing. Do we have time for one? Do we have time for one letter? All right. We've got time for one letter. Here's a letter. It's uh, from Jed. It says, hi, Matt and Rob. I'm quickly appreciating your podcast. I help facilitate a group of middle and high schoolers at a weekly 3.5 slash 5e group in Bellingham. I appreciate your episode on world building. The notion of having short, middle, and long-term world building facts is a great rule of thumb. As our fall season is ending, I'm hoping to introduce for the winter season a new gestalt. Everyone submits slips of near, middle, and long-term history in a hat and then has to do a one-shot episode with whatever they pull out. Um, What do you think, This Rob? is some... I mean, I love the idea. I think it's a super interesting approach. I would love to hear more about what teachers like this have to do with their students, right? To, to really get them to think creatively when they have these... RPG or D&D clubs, right? And I think the idea of, oh, pull three random facts out of your hat and then uh, everyone pulls, you know, everyone submits three, everyone pulls three, and they all get to make a one shot out of it. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I think so too. I think this is a great way to to start. This is a bit like microscope, right? This is a great way to introduce just to sort of like break down the functional bits of world building. I think this is a great idea, especially if these are people who have not written or run a one shot before. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. 
here's here's one thing since they're just one shots and and they're just middle and high schoolers right i would make sure i would want to as this club facilitator make sure i review all of the students hooks before they go into the Mm. hat to make sure none of them are too difficult and to probably um model writing some ahead of time and you might also like broaden it right you might try one where it's like everyone write a monster a moral dilemma a location and a piece of history or Mm -hmm. something like that right and try mixing it up like that and so you all get a random uh your your thing is uh is a, a white dragon right a submarine and so you know oh the challenge is okay write a one shot where you where there's a white dragon on a submarine for some reason yeah I would also, if you're going to stick with the three bits of world building lore, uh, the near, middle, and long term, I would, I would give nice. each player or each designer a a wild card, uh, something either they can redraw or uh, swap out one of the the pieces in case it's it ends up being too challenging. Just, just because this sounds like actually like a pretty, I I think this is a great test, but I actually think that this sounds like it could be real hard depending on what you end up with. So that would, that would be my only suggestion, but I think it's a great idea. I'm curious to see how it goes. The other thing is you could always have every person do two and draw two for each one. And they get to pick which one they like. Ah, That would be good too. Right. But yeah, Jen, I think this is a super good idea. I would love to hear how it turns out. Yeah. Um, Please let us know if you are uh, a teacher uh, running a D and D club for suits. This, this stuff is fascinating. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening uh if you want us to campaign doctor if you have other questions for us if you have any sort of suggestions or thoughts please uh add us on twitter at dm of none uh email us at dm of none at gmail.com give us a call on our hotline that number is rob 774-203-4629 again 774-203-4629 the dungeon master hotline and thank you everyone uh we just checked the stats in the last 18 months our show has been listened to and downloaded over a hundred thousand times yes. which is uh, ridiculous uh, absurd it's terrible What's the matter with you but yes thank you for the big 100k uh we'll be doing this for as long as you can bear it but uh, yeah, thanks for listening, everybody, and happy 2020. Happy 2020. Keep rolling them dice. Call me Dr. Worm. Good morning. How are you? I'm Dr. Worm. I'm interested in things. I'm not a real doctor, but I am a real worm.